It's fantastic to be in a room filled with so many people, like-minded people who, you know, I'm sure you're all here because you want to learn some more and you want to help young kids to be better and to, they're the future of sport in Ireland. And so that's probably part of the reason why you're here today is to learn a little bit more because we all have our own ideas, we have our own beliefs, we have our own theories about coaching methods and how we do it. And um, for me, I suppose, I have a little theory myself um, about the length of time it takes to be a great athlete and to be a great athlete on the world stage. And um, I suppose this is not something that I've read in a book. It's not something that anybody has told me. It's something that I have kind of observed over time and from, I actually looked at my own career and I looked at careers of other athletes who I have been involved with down through the years. Um, my husband, he coaches a number of athletes. And um, so I suppose what a, my theory is that it takes seven years from the moment when you're a 16, 17 or 18 year old athlete and you make people sit up in their seats and take notice, it's going to take you an average of seven years to be a great athlete and to really make a mark on the world stage. For me, this is 1987 at the Cork City Sports. This is the biggest international athletics event in Ireland. It still is today, they're in their 65th year. And you know, for me to run there as a 17 year old was unbelievable. You know, I had watched people like, um, you know, um, Daly Thompson, um, Mary Slaney, uh, Frank O'Mara, John Walker, Marcus O'Sullivan, Eamon Coughlin, John Tracy, all these great athletes had taken part and here was I going to go up there and not only run in the Cork City Sports but win in the Cork City Sports and this was 1987 and then six years later up here in the right hand corner is 1993 at the World Championships in Stuttgart and I finished second and I suppose I probably could have changed the average but we didn't really know there was going to be such, that someone had put in an order for such a big Chinese takeaway back then. <laughs> and below here is 1995, so that was eight years later when I actually became world champion in Gothenburg over 5,000 meters. But the seven year average was in 1994 when for the first time I won an international major competition. And I think that this picture it shows, you know, this, I suppose the joy and the exhilaration of, you know, the amount of work and effort and time that it put in to, to win that and to, to win a gold medal on the, I suppose it was equivalent to the world stage, it was nearly as good as you get. Um, and, you know, this picture says it all, even though I didn't even know it at the time, I didn't know that it was seven years of hard work. To me, it was just another race that I had won. And, but, you know, I think instinctively and intrinsically, I must have known something you know, that had taken this long and put in years and years of hard work to get to that point. Um, so, and then this here is just one other picture. 1987 was a bit of a golden year for me in Ireland. This was the um, Irish National Cross Country Championships um, that I won in Killin All, the senior championships. It's the only time that I have ever won the Irish Senior Cross Country Championships when I was 17 years old. And it took 11 years, 11 years later, so that was a, a fair bit of hard work, persistence, patience, lots of ups and downs along the way to win the World Cross Country Championships, not just once but twice in the one weekend. Um, so I suppose looking back at you know, my career and you know, we're here today to talk about coaching and especially in um, focusing on the perspective of putting youth into perspective when thinking about coaching. So, when I was first asked to come along and speak here, I kind of thought, where am I going to start with this? And the first thought that came into my mind was that I should call up my coach in Cove from those great years in the 80s, uh, Sean Kennedy. And I was out for a walk over in Malahide, and I was walking along the seafront, and I thought, I must call Sean when I get back. And I thought, how do I get his phone number? And as I finished the run, the number just came into my head. And it's amazing because I bet everybody in this room has a mobile phone, but there's very few 
phone numbers that you would actually know right now because they're all stored in the phone. And I think to myself, right, I know my parents' number, I know the home number at home, I know my husband's number, um, and I know two of my coaches' phone numbers. And I couldn't believe that the number that came into my head, I went back in and I called up Sean and I said, listen, I've got to do this talk about coaching and um, you know, everything I know about coaching, I learned from you, so I need to come and meet you. So I was amazed that I actually remembered the phone number. So I suppose for me, the, what I want to talk to you about here today is how coaching has impacted me um, down through the years. And you know, to start with being coached as a young athlete. And you know, I think you know, there's a point in particularly boys and girls in secondary school, and a coach can be the most influential person in their life. You know, there's times when they're more influential than the parents, definitely more influential than the teachers, because the coach is telling them something that they want to hear about something that they want to really do and they want to improve on and that they love and they enjoy. So they're going to listen to the coach and do whatever the coach tells them. So you have to remember that when you're telling the kids this, that they're listening to every word that you say and they're believing that everything you say you know, is going to make them great and it's going to be good for them. So you have to, I suppose, as much as you want the kids to respect you, you've got to also respect them and treat them all as individuals. And so my coach, Sean Kennedy, um, I suppose initially when I started training in Cove, I didn't have a coach, I had a trainer and his name was Pat O'Halloran. And um, Pat was a great guy. He was, I was, we were kind of 13, 14 year olds, and he was 20. So he wasn't much older than us, so he was a lot of fun. But he really wanted to kind of, he enjoyed having the um, young Ballymore Cove athletes come and train at the track. And my earliest memories are running around the track in the dark, and always meeting under a lamppost and having a bit of a chat and a laugh beforehand. And then we'd get on with the training that was to be done. But the things I really remember are, you know, nights that we would take a break from the track and we'd run out the road. And I don't know if many of you know Cove, but it's very hilly down there. There's not too many flat roads. There's three flat roads, actually, that you can run on. The, the low road, the high road, and the lake road. So we used to go out the low road and it runs alongside the train that comes down from Cork. And we'd get out there and there's two bridges go over the tracks. And we'd race out the road to get up on the bridge and meet the train as it was coming in from Cork. And we'd all stand on the bridge and wave at the train driver and get him to flash the light and hoot the horn. And that was our highlight of the week. You know? And th little things like that are the things that kind of keep young kids coming back week after week. Because there's a bit of enjoyment and there's things that they love doing with their friends. So you can't always just focus on the best athletes in the team. Um, you've got to focus on all of them because they all have an important role to play to keep the best athletes there and maybe some of them who are not so good today may be better in the future. Um, so I suppose for Sean then, Pat was great for a few years but then he called up Sean Kennedy and he said, listen, I've got this young girl here and I know what to do with her, but she's very good. So um, Sean called me out and he said, I, I actually asked him for a training program and um, so I'd go out to his house and he'd call me into the kitchen. I'd sit at the kitchen table and he'd bring out this book. And it was like a science book. It was this big book, big thick book, Training Distance Runners by Peter Coe, Sebastian Coe's father. And there was all sorts of stuff in it. And he used to fill my mind with all these things about training. And, you know, I really, I suppose, I didn't really understand everything that he was telling me at the time. But somehow it was all going in. Because there was little things, he used to say things like there'd be aerobic conditioning, anaerobic training, aerobic capacity, anaerobic capacity, general mobility, circuits, weights, gym. This was all before core and pilates and these things. And health maintenance, where you look after your diet, your sleep, and your lifestyle choices. These are all coaching lessons that at the time, you know, he was telling me all this stuff, and this was all the stuff that I was supposed to think about in one week, every week. And all I wanted to know was, what was I supposed to do for training on Monday? <laughs> and so we'd have these big discussions, and he'd say, I'll drop the training program in on my way to work tomorrow morning. 
And sure enough, I'd get up on Monday morning and there'd be two weeks training in the letterbox. And they'd have a list of everything for me to do. So it was all these kind of, um, I suppose, it was like a kind of a prescription of training for me to do every day. And I did a lot of the training by myself. And uh, I used to love it. I really, really enjoyed the training. Um, but, you know, it would be all, there'd be certain things on different days. There'd be a long run and a short run and a fast run and a hilly run. And you might go to the track on a Wednesday um, because we had a half day from school. And um, every now and then things would change in my week. So I would change the days around in the training program. I think it fitted in with what I was doing. And then I kind of said to Sean one day, I said, does it really matter if I run hills on a Wednesday or a Saturday? And he said, well, you know, if you were running a race on a Sunday, you wouldn't ideally run hills on a Saturday. And then I started to think, oh, yeah, maybe I should stick to the program. Um, but, you know, it was little things like that that, you know, these are all the coaching lessons that I still live by today and that they're so important to me. And, you know, I think the things that I suppose as a young athlete, you're, you're like a sponge, you know, you're not always interested in the things that the coaches are telling you. But somehow, I think the messages are getting in there and they come back to you later in life. And that's where, for me, um, I, I suppose now, I suppose as a, I, I always hate to say I'm a retired athlete because I, I still like to go out there and do something and to keep fit and everything. But, you know, I don't compete, I suppose, internationally as much as I used to. So I now, I suppose, pay more attention to um, young, young kids and Particularly, you know, I have two teenage children. I have a 15 year old Kira and 13 year old Sophie. And um, they're both involved in different sports in Australia. And um, so I'm very aware of kind of paying attention to the different coaching that they actually get from different coaches. And particularly Sophie, she's involved in a, a number of sports. She's 13 years old. And she takes part, she runs a bit and she takes part in, uh, she plays basketball and she plays soccer. And, you know, I'm always fascinated by the different styles of coaching and the way that the kids react to it. And for the athletics, you know, I don't really push her too much. Of course, I enjoy watching her running and I think it's, that probably is her number one sport. But she enjoys being part of a team and having her friends around her. So I'm not going to take her away from that and get her to go and run laps around the track. So I remember we first went to um, the basketball training and um, some of my friends said to me, oh, you just need to drop her in and you don't stay because he, the coach, he doesn't like you to stay. And I'd heard he was a bit kind of, uh, I don't know how you would describe it, but he was a bit aggressive anyway. <laughs> and you know, you're dropping in your 10 year old daughter to this guy and um, he likes to do a lot of yelling and shouting, but the kids, they, they seem to react well to it. And I remember the very first day I went in there and I thought, well, I better go in anyway and um, just see what's going on here. So we're in there and the coach, he was in there, he was talking to somebody else. So we're standing waiting, you know, I was going to say, this is Sophie and she's going to start training with you. And she was standing there ready to go. She had her basketball and she's bouncing the ball on the ground and she's bouncing away, and next thing he turns around and he lets out a scream at her, would you ever stop bouncing that ball? And I thought, oh my God, he scared the life out of me. I thought, how is she going to cope with this? And um, so I said, right, I'm off then, <laughs> I'll see ya. And um, <laughs> so maybe he was scaring me away. <laughs> and, um, but it's amazing because the, she plays basketball and if I ever say, and if anybody ever says anything negative about the coach, and he does tend to yell and scream and get a bit dramatic on the, on the sidelines, um, she'll, she'll never have any bad words said against him. So the respect that he has, and he obviously has a good relationship with the girls because they've been playing basketball now for four years and they love it. But then on the other hand, she plays soccer. And the soccer coach is a very different man altogether. And I met him last week because I actually really like his style of coaching. It's, he's very kind of welcoming to everybody and he wants everybody involved. He wants the parents to hang around and even join in the training sometimes. And um, so I said to him, I said, what is it, you know? What, what, what is it, you know, that you seem to, you know, you get the best out of these girls. And he said, well, you just have to be, you have to be kind to them and you have to be gentle. And I couldn't, this was like strange words for a coach to say. And, 
it was just the way he said it that all of a sudden I realized that that's exactly what it was and he just made everybody feel like you know they, they should be there and um, it was just I suppose a, a method of coaching that I said to him well uh, what kind of how, how do you think about things and he said well you know he said they're young girls and they like to talk so when they turn up for the warm-up I just let them talk away and get them to kick the ball up and down and he said they're talking so their heads are up so that's what they need to do anyway because they need to look where they're kicking the ball so I let them on with that and you know they're, they're learning they're learning something but then when we need to do some training then they stop the talking and they listen to me and then at the end of the training they play a game and then the parents come so they start training at quarter to seven on a Wednesday evening and um, they're supposed to finish in an hour but we all go to pick them up at quarter to eight and they're just about starting a little fun game that they're having and I think part of the reason is so that the parents all join in and get involved in the game as well um, but there was an interesting thing happened after one year of being with the soccer team and um, there was a few emails went around last year and um, there was, they were in, I think, this, the C team or something, or maybe it was a B team. But a few emails went around anyway, and a few coaches in the club, they wanted to recruit all the best soccer players and get them to play in the A team. And so we got emails and, you know, would you change teams? And there was going to be this, one of the dads who was on our team wanted to be one of the coaches. And so there was a little bit of friction and tension, and the emails were constantly going around. And so, as parents, we somehow all really thought that the girls got on really well together in this team, and did we really want to split this team up and have a super team? Or did we want them to have a team where they all couldn't wait to go training on a Wednesday night, and they really had a good time when they played on a Sunday, and sometimes they won and sometimes they lost, so they got a taste of success, and they really had a good time, and at the end of the game, you know, for five minutes after the game they were happy or disappointed but then they continu continued on with their lives so it turns out that we kept the team together and it was the best thing that we did um, because you know there was a there was trials and different things going on in the club for a few weeks and you could sense that the girls weren't very happy but as soon as they knew that the team was going to be kept together again they just kind of continued on with what they did and they finished top of the league this year and so now they've kind of earned their spot and they're going to be moving up to the, the B team next year. And, you know, we always kind of thought, well, does it really matter when you're 12 and 13 years old if you're in the A team, the B team or the C team? Because who really cares and who's going to remember that, you know, in seven years' time? And, um, you know, one of the things when I met um, up with my coach there um, last week or a couple of weeks ago, Sean, and I called out to his house and he said, come into the kitchen here. And we sat down at the table and he brought out a whole load of sheets of paper and slides of talks and different things he'd done. And he said, the most important thing is that they're still involved in the sport when they're 16, 17 and 18 years old. You, don't, you can't push the kids away before that because that's when they can really start training. And that is the most important time in the young athlete's career. Um, so I suppose... Um, we lost here now. The, the thing I suppose that I learned from observing Sophie and her training and you know her friends training is that you need to have a team of champions not a champion team and you know so a team of champions everybody in the team has a purpose you know everybody they're not all the best athletes out there some of them you know they can't run a race they can't definitely can't run a cross-country race um, but they're all out there and they all have their role to play and they enjoy it and that's the most important thing is that they enjoy it and they continue to do it for as many years as possible because you just want to get as many of the kids as fit as possible and I suppose as the years go on and of course the cream will eventually come to the top and the better athletes will ask for more coaching and they'll want to be pushed harder then all the girls who were on the team with them will still be their friends and they will be the ones who will support them and encourage them you know, as they go on to do greater things. And the girls who were on the team with them, they may not be the best sports people out there, but they'll have had a taste of success and they will be able to take that into other areas of their life and realize that if we work hard 
and we work as a team and we work together that we can be successful. And um, so I suppose that's how I kind of came to have my understanding of training was from my own impact, now from watching the young kids training and how they're doing it. And, you know, there was, there was another story this year happened. Um, Sophie, she's, um, she was running on the school team, um, athletics team, and she, because that's her better sport, she has to run on the team. And they have school sport training in school on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And so I thought, oh, this is great. She'll be doing a little bit of athletics training now. And she might get a little bit more focused on this. And um, so she went off anyway to the athletics training on the, the first Tuesday. And I could send, I, of course, turned up, pick her up. I said, how was training? And I was dying, expecting, you know, it was great and loved it. And I didn't really get much of a reaction. And I could sense that she didn't really enjoy it. And so we were kind of trying to fish around and find out, you know, why would she not like that? So eventually, anyway, it turned out that um, because her school is lots of there's a few different campuses, so a lot of the girls on the team, her age, were not at her campus. So when she went training in her her age level, there was no other girls, and she just didn't like being there by herself. And um, so I kind of thought, that's I don't know, I'd have to figure something else out. And I was trying to think, do I have to take her to another campus, or what are we going to do? And then we realised that one of the other sports that they offered at the school at that term was soccer. So I went and I spoke to one of the teachers and I said, well, how about Sophie trains with the soccer team on Tuesday and Thursday, and then she can just run with the athletics team on the weekend? And they said, that's grand. And so it all worked out perfect. So I suppose for me, the thing is that, you know, there's so many kids taking part in so many different sports that you have to respect all the other sports and you have to use some of the other sports to benefit what you're really trying to do. And they all help each other. And to me, you know, athletics is a very specific event and you really don't want to be too specific too early with young athletes because they're still growing and they're still developing and it's a lot of body weight running around and the important thing is to develop skills and when you go to team sports there's a lot of time taken to warm up, there's a lot of drills, there's a lot of different skills that you don't do in running and so I think by doing that the kids are training and they don't even realize they're training because they're having fun and they're playing games. And that's probably what it's all about at the end of the day. And I suppose the three most important things to remember for young athletes is your general fitness. And by general fitness, I mean walking the dog, walking to school if you can, you know, not taking the car everywhere. And just doing normal things, you know, you know if, you're, if their friends live within a mile, then they should be able to walk to and from the friend's house. Um, I know um, our kids, they come home from school sometimes and they will go to another friend's house. So then I will walk up to meet them with the dog because, and then make them walk home. And, you know, every now and then they'll kind of say, oh, are we walking? <laughs> and I say, yeah, we are. But, you know, it's amazing. If you walk home with the kids from somewhere, you get so much more information out of them. They talk to you so much more. Um, because they think when you're driving that you should be concentrating on driving and not distracting them from being on their iPhone or whatever they're on. <laughs> um, oh, sorry. Um, so, and then enjoyment and passion. You know, you have to, I suppose, ingrain that into the kids that, you know, what they're doing, they're enjoying it and they're loving it. And they really have to want to get out there and training, um, training, playing, whatever they're doing. And this can, I suppose, eventually that feeds into other things that you do in life and you know health and fitness eventually you hope that you know whether if you're not if you're not going to the world championships or the olympics or whatever it is that you, you still maintain that health and fitness and the, the the love of you know the good feeling that you get from sport and and then a taste of success you know i mentioned that before and i think that is it's very important you know when i was a 17 year old i had an amazing taste of success winning the cork city sports winning the irish national championships I had a number of years where I was injured, but I always knew that I could do it. And by knowing that you can do it, then you, you just persist and you work hard and you want to get back there because you know that feeling and you want to experience it again. And I had that a number of times throughout my career where you had a few ups and downs along the way. But I suppose as long as I knew that I could train and I could run fast, then I knew that there was always a possibility that I could get back out there and get back up there and you know, win, win medals. Um, so then people often ask me, they say, you know, but um, genetics, does that play a role in, um, 
you know, how young kids, you know, the, the best athlete, you know, if the parents are good or the kid's going to be good. And, you know, you, you like to think that maybe it is, but there's so many other variable factors that come into play that there's no guarantee, you know, that just because I was an Olympic silver medalist that, you know, any of my children are going to go on and, you know, ever, you know, run internationally or, you know, even, well, yeah, I suppose anything like that, you know. So you don't, you can never take that for granted. But I suppose one thing that was pointed out to me this year, and it's quite interesting here, I don't know, is there anyone can notice anything with these photos here? <laughs> yes, it's, well, when I cross the finish line here, it's kind of like a little shy kind of like, you're not quite celebrating, uh, not quite putting the hands up there. And Sophie had never seen this photo in her life before. And um, this was in Edinburgh earlier in 2014. And um, she finished the line and um, I sent a photo home and then I got this one sent back to me. <laughs> I said, there's a little bit of genetics there. <laughs> so let's see how far it goes. Um, but you know, this is one of my favorite slides, I think. Um, <laughs> if every kid, you know, goes out the door to training like that, <laughs> then I think you've achieved something as a coach. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, you know, I think there's a, this, this photo is actually quite similar, you know, it's like, there's not much difference there. <laughs> I think I <laughs> in the European Championships in 1998, and um, I was given an opportunity, I suppose, to win a gold medal. Um, I had never run a 10,000 meter race before in my life, and um, I looked up the results, and I saw that most of them were kind of run in tactical races with a fast finish and I thought I think I can probably do that and uh, so I think this was the finish of the 10,000 meters and I was I was so excited I couldn't believe that you know I had kind of taken I suppose the the, the risk or the you know some people said why would you do that you know it's high risk when you could be running the 5,000 meters and to be able to go out there and run 27 seconds fastest 200 meter ever at the end of a 10,000 meter race um, so, yeah, no, I was as happy as if the gate was left open. <laughs> um, so I think um, there's a, a couple of things here I want to leave you with. And, you know, I think one of the big things, things that you can, I suppose, um, I suppose, say to the young athletes is, you know, when you have to set goals and targets and you have to, I suppose, you know, give them a reason um, the motivation, you know, is the reason to come to training and to get the results. And so, you know, the goals that you set, they should be smart goals. And by smart goals, we mean specific. You know, you need to have a specific target that you want to aim for. And these are specific and they can, they're generally short term as well. You know, I mean, you don't say, right, we're going to go for the Olympics in eight years time. Um, we might do that. But before that, we're going to go and win the East Corks. Um, so they have to be measurable goals, you know, so you have to have, a, you know, a little bit of time when you're going to achieve this in, you know, and you have to, I suppose, you do the training and then we're going to go out and we're going to have a test and see where we're at. And then it's like a little stepping stone and then we'll move on from there. And the goals that you set, they have to be achievable because you have to, they have to be achievable and attainable. They can't be too far out of reach because if they're too hard, then you're going to get, um, you're probably going to get a little bit disheartened and, you know, you may not, Sometimes you have to set, them a little, set the bar a little bit lower, you know, and allow the kids to achieve success, you know, at a, a manageable rate. And then you have to record it, write it down and keep a track of it. Okay, we've got to this level now. Where are we going next? Let's take the next step. And then you have to set little time frames on when you're going to do that. So you break the year down into, okay, we're going to do this in the spring, the summer, the autumn, the winter. And just break down the year into, you know, not just one huge big picture, but I like to see it as a jigsaw puzzle and there's lots of little pieces and we'll put, you know, maybe we'll do the outside first and then we'll fill in a few corners and eventually we'll get the whole picture done and have quite a few success throughout the year. And then, you know, everybody wants to achieve success and how do you achieve success? You know, I think you have to pursue excellence to achieve success and that means that you have to be always looking for new things, different things. Not everybody has 
all the right answers. There's not one way of doing anything. There's so many different ways. And it's great you know, to have so many coaches here in the room today. If you have the opportunity, you should take it you know, to talk to each other and share your ideas. You know, there might be some people in here who teams that you compete against, and you're curious about, why do you do that? So why not ask them? <laughs> There's no secrets. There should be no secret training. You know, um, <laughs> we used to always go on about this, about people doing secret training. And um, you know, if they wouldn't tell you what they were doing. But I'm always happy to tell people what, what I am doing, because you know, it's all the same stuff, really, kind of bundled up into different little packages. And I think the more that we can work together, the more information that you can share, the more success that we will have as a united group and you know, as a country as a whole. Thanks.